Brothers and sisters, it's good to welcome you to our lecture today. Um, John Christopher Thomas, PhD from University of Sheffield, is the Clarence J. Abbott Professor of Biblical Studies at the Pentecostal Theological Seminary in Cleveland, Tennessee, and the Director of the Center for Pentecostal and Charismatic Studies at Bangor University in Bangor, Wales. Professor Thomas is an elected member of the Society of New Testament Studies and author of numerous scholarly articles and eight books. He and his spouse Barbara have two daughters, two sons-in-law, and one granddaughter. Just a little bit of a uh, description here on, on uh, Professor Thomas's lecture. Pentecostalism is one of the fastest growing Christian faiths in the world today. How might the Book of Mormon be viewed within that context. Professor Thomas is back at Brigham Young University to talk about the Book of Mormon's reception among and relevance to Pentecostals past and present. And so we'll turn our time over to uh, Professor John Christopher Thomas. Well, it is good to be here today. Appreciate you turning up. I'm always amazed when people turn up to hear what I have to say. <laughs> and uh, I'm very appreciative that you are here today. Um, BYU story for you. I took a home study course in 1978 on the uh, first half of Mormon history through, well, as I like to describe it, you could see the tail lights on the wagons as they crossed the Mississippi. That's where the course ended. And um, when I was here last, Brian arranged for me to be able to make use of the library. So they were going to issue me a library ticket. And they said, well, just put your information in here. And so I did. And they said, well, it looks like we have a duplicate record on you. I said, oh, really? That home study course, you, you kept note of that. <laughs> I told a friend of mine who used to teach at, at University of Utah for a number of years about it. He said, think of where you are, Chris. <laughs> Record keepers. <laughs> they know you. In fact, they even had an address I forgot I used at the time. So there's my, my BYU story. Um, my last presentation I made, I got to this point. And this is where we want to pick up this time. Let me just say uh, a, a couple of words about Brian Hoglid. Brian, uh, ever since Eric uh, Eliason introduced us uh, at a meeting in the autumn of 2013, Brian and I have become pretty fast friends. And um, we, we've discovered why that is. Apparently, we were born within a 12-hour period from one another in the, same year. in the same year that's right September 1 September 2 and Brian claims that we were friends in a pre-existent world <laughs> which I have no memory of <laughs> but he says in fact that he remembers the last thing he said to me was I'll see you in 60 years and that my last words were what's a year and what, 60 of them? I, of course, am at a complete disadvantage to Brian, not working in the world of pre-existent uh, belief. And, of course, that whole story is entirely apocryphal. But I say it as a way of saying thanks to my friend for all the things that he's done to help facilitate my study. Very quickly, I was introduced to the Book of Mormon in uh, January of 74, college touring choir I was on, uh, came through Salt Lake. We got the great acoustic demonstration in the tabernacle, and some of us went through the visitor center and were given that Book of Mormon with the iconic light blue cover with the golden angel on the front. And um, I began to, from that point on, have various kinds of interaction in 2013, I had a sabbatic and, and got approval to finish up various projects. 
uh, you got to keep your day job, you know. And uh, I got the projects finished, but I also decided to close the loop on some Book of Mormon stuff for myself. So I uh, took a course, a graduate level reading course on the Book of Mormon with a guy named Del Luffman at the uh, Community of Christ Seminary. And he had given, I'd read a lot of stuff already, but he gave me an extensive list. And as I was working my way through it, I discovered what all this was about. Uh, and I sensed that what this was about was I was supposed to write a book on the Book of Mormon, uh, the kind of book that I wish I had read, because most of the stuff I found on the Book of Mormon had to do with um, is it true or not, uh, historical issues. And, and those are important issues, obviously. But I was interested in things like uh, structure, of the book, content of the book, more than the sort of cherry-picking sorts of events that, that you sometimes get, um, the theology of the book, not in the light of the Bible, but what, what arises out of the book itself. Uh, what does it have to say about different themes? I was quite interested in the uh, reception history of the book, what kind of impact it had had, art, literature, um, believers, unbelievers. And then I was interested in putting the Book of Mormon into conversation with my own tradition, uh, Pentecostalism. Uh, Pentecostalism, the modern variation, emerged around the turn of uh, the last century. There are, by various accountings, somewhere around 600 million people today who identify with the Pentecostal charismatic renewal in one sense or another. Uh, several churches with memberships uh, worldwide comparable to the LDS church is a pretty large phenomenon. And I found that not too many people were, were putting these traditions, these books, into conversation. Um, but both of our movements began as uh, restorationist movements. Both of our movements began as prophetic movements. Both of our movements began as spirit movements. It seemed to me that a conversation would be a helpful thing. You know, not that, you know, last time I was here, I thought about saying all of you that would like to be converted, stand over here, and all of you that want to convert me, stand over there, and, and I'll get to you really quick because this line won't, there won't be a very big line. But there are ways of talking to one another that are not geared to are you right or wrong on such and such a topic. There are ways of conversing. And I think one of the reasons why our traditions haven't done more formal things has been I think we're, we're both afraid of one another. I mean, we know how crazy the Mormons are in my circles. And all you have to do to know how crazy we are is to turn on the TV, <laughs> right, and see the mutations that are there. When I first went to the Hill Camorra, I was coming in one night, and I was driving by to the hotel I was staying in, and I saw it, and I said, I know this place. There is, in my tradition, a very similar place called Fields of the Wood, that uh, one of our early leaders in later years would claim that the church was restored on one of the mountaintops there, that God spoke to him in a time of prayer. Now, if you can imagine the hill Camorra being matched by another hill straight across from it, and those hills being about a third taller than the hill Camorra, then you get a picture of the fields of the wood. Which one? And I, either one. And I, um, I discovered that they both kind of took on their shapes in the 1930s. Um, and I wondered who influenced whom. I've assumed that one of the prime movers in the fields of the woods had somehow made it to Palmyra, 
but I'm still trying to trying to sort that out. I don't I don't have any idea. But I was struck by the similarities there uh, on such a simple thing as that. So what I'm tr- trying to do in this part of my book is to start turning up some ground, start some conversations, um, and, and kind of see where all that goes. I mean, we're, we're all here people who have a sense of um, the divine presence and who have a sense of God's will in our lives. And um, who knows what God is up to at times. All I know is I was supposed to do this if nobody else read it, I was supposed to do it for myself. And fortunately, there have been a lot of people who have joined in along the way. Now, a disclaimer. There will be some language used that could very well be offensive in the way that Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, Mormonism, gets described in early Pentecostal documents. Uh, and I apologize Uh, if you are offended by that. Uh, I certainly do not intend to cause any offense in such ways. And, of course, I know that I don't know your context nearly well enough to know the things that I will offend you with that I have no idea I'm offending you. So if you will absolve me from the beginning, I'll feel much better. Surprisingly, there are several individuals who either anticipated the early modern Pentecostal movement or were a leader in the early Pentecostal movement who had beliefs similar to or actual contact with uh, Mormon folk. And I want to survey some of that work now with this handy Dan device. So, historical theological connections between Book of Mormon themes and some early Pentecostal forerunners and early leaders. First of all, Edward Irving. Edward Irving, 1792 to 1834. Irving was educated at the University of Edinburgh, where he graduated at the age of 17. In 1822, Irving accepted a pastorate of a small Church of Scotland congregation in London, Within a few years, it grew to the point that a new building had to be constructed at Regent Square. Massive crowds attended. He discerned his role as a prophetic figure, becoming convinced that the fivefold ministry gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers from Ephesians 4 had been lost or abandoned by the modern church. And consequently, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was no longer manifest within the church. Eventually, the manifestation of the charismata, including glossolalia, prophecy, and healing, occurred at his parish, as well as in churches where he had preached. Being censured for advocating and presiding over such activities, Irving led some 800 members from the Regent Street Church to form the Catholic Apostolic Church. The church would eventually have 12 apostles, give a prominent place to prophecy, healing, speaking in tongues, and exhibit a strong eschatological orientation. Significantly for for our interests, a Reverend John Hewart from a church in Barnsley, England, who was part of the Catholic Apostolic Church, made contact with Joseph Smith in June of 1835, seeking to explore the possibility of affiliating with the Mormons, owing to their being what um, Hewitt called kindred spirits. Now, alerted to the Mormons and their thought by means of a church-owned newspaper, Hewitt's contact by post was followed up by a personal visit. Hewitt's letter of introduction promised numbers of his people would join the ranks despite any persecution that might come. They called themselves saints, with Hewitt writing, Oh, may our faith increase 
that he may have evangelists, apostles, and prophets filled with the power of the Spirit, performing his will in describing in destroying the works of darkness. He meets Smith in Kirtland. They expect Hewitt to return, but that did not materialize. Instead, he settled in nearby Painesville, Ohio, instead, securing an appointment as the preceptor of the Painesville Academy. Now, the only other thing that you need to know about Painesville is that's where my wife was born. (laughs) Something of the vulnerability felt by Joseph Smith, owing to the similarities between the LDS and the Irvingites, can be detected by an editorial apparently written by Smith several years later that appeared in the Times and Seasons. In this five-page essay entitled, Try the Spirits, Smith devotes about half the space to the Irvingites, explaining their origins, beliefs, practices, as well as offering reasons why he rejects their claims to authentic manifestations of the Spirit in the last days. Despite the fact that the Irvingites had counterfeited the truth, perhaps the nearest of any of our modern sectarians, Smith offers four enumerated reasons that he found them to be lacking. First of all, he says the church was organized by women, and God placed in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, not first women. But Mr. Irving placed in his church women, secondarily apostles, And the church was founded and organized them. A woman has no right to found or organize a church. God never sent them to do it. Second, those women would speak in the midst of a meeting and rebuke Mr. Irving or any of the church. Now the scripture positively says, Thou shalt not rebuke an elder, but entreat him as a father. Not only this, but they frequently accuse the brethren, thus placing themselves in the seat of Satan, who is emphatically called the accuser of the brethren. Third, Mr. Baxter, an early Irvingite leader, received the Spirit on asking for it without attending to the ordinances and began to prophesy, whereas the scriptural way of attaining the gift of the Holy Ghost is by baptism and by laying on of hands. Fourth, as we've stated in regard to others, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, but those prophets were subject to the spirits, the spirit controlling their bodies at pleasure. Now several aspects of this editorial are deserving of note. First, the fact that this response came several years after the Mormons' first encounter with the Irvingites reveals that the latter's growth and similarities in teaching were seen in some ways as creating a rival for church Smith and his church. Second, Smith's primary criticism that the Irvingite church was created by women appears on the one hand to be consistent with the depiction of the role of women in the Book of Mormon, um, and on the other hand illustrates one of the differences between the Book of Mormon early Mormonism perhaps, and these forerunners of the modern Pentecostal movement where women have and do play prominent roles in gospel proclamation and church planting. Third, it would be interesting to ask whether Smith's words about spirit reception and the laying on of hands would have been offered with the same emphasis earlier owing to the fact that there are no instances in the Book of Mormon where individuals are actually described as receiving the Spirit in this fashion. The words of Jesus in uh, Moroni 2, 1 through 3, notwithstanding. So it's very interesting. Uh, If you dig around historically, uh, I think um, Grant Underwood has uh, offered some helpful discussions of some of the Irvingites and kind of follows out on this event. Second, John Alexander Dowie, 1847 and 1907. Born in Edinburgh, Scotland, Dowie immigrated to Australia as an early man, 
where he decided to go into Christian ministry. He returned to Edinburgh for his theological training, and he subsequently returned to Australia, where he eventually served a very successful pastorate, but then abruptly resigned. Becoming convinced of the importance of divine healing, Dowley, his wife, and their two children migrated to the U.S. in 1888. Traveling and ministering throughout the western portion of the country, Dowie would eventually establish a headquarters near Chicago for his rapidly growing following. Establishing the Christian Catholic Apostolic Church in a city he would name Zion City, where more than 6,000 of his followers would gather, Dowie went on to benefit from a masterful public relations move where he held meetings across the entrance to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Dowie believed in healing, prophecy, apostolic Christianity. He would eventually identify himself as a prophet, as Elijah the Restorer, and then the first apostle of an end-time apostolate. Significantly, Dowie himself made a visit to Salt Lake City on his way across America. This encounter appears to have occurred sometime during 1890 when he first makes known his intention. In a sermon preached several years later, Dowie would reflect back on his considerable time spent in Salt Lake City. Claiming to have studied the LDS church closely and having been given access to the internal workings of the church, Dowie says that he was treated as a prince of the church. Finding that the LDS church was the best organized and most clearly scripturally organized of all churches, keeping close to the apostolic model. Apparently, Dowie came to explore the possibility of joining the LDS church, as well as the possibility of being brought into the church as an apostle. When this This did not occur when he was informed that's not the way it worked there. He left Utah to establish his own organization. He would go on to have a global significance and eventually influence numbers of Pentecostal leaders, especially in the finished work stream of the Pentecostal tradition. Now what has not widely been known or fully appreciated until more recently is the extent to which Dowie's teachings would overlap with that of the LDS movement. This includes the significant role of Isaiah, the headquarters cities of Zion, the similarity in organization between Zion and Nauvoo, for example, the similarities with regard to the prophetic and apostolic nature of leadership, the belief in continuous revelation, the expectation of the recovery of ancient texts that would be on a par with the Old and New Testament as scripture, and the belief that God was once a man, and that humanity could become gods. Stung from his rejection by the LDS Church, Dowie planned to bring three to 5,000 crusaders to Utah to convert the Mormons in 1904, a challenge to which the LDS Church leadership responded with the promise that he would make few inroads with the members, charging that much of what is good in Dowieism is clearly borrowed from the doctrines of the church. It is clearly plagiarism. The distinctive Dowie features are almost repulsive. Such a system can make no lasting impression upon a people that lives in the light of the truth. End quote. But things are not quite what they always seem in public communications. For on the one hand, a survey of the Salt Lake City newspapers of the era reveals over 136 references to Dowie. Now, Dowie's in Chicago, and I assume you know where Salt Lake is. A number of references suggesting that the church and its members monitored his work closely, perhaps suggesting that owing to the numerous similarities between the groups, they viewed Dowie as more of a threat than their public words indicated. 
On the other hand, it now appears that it was part of Dowie's plan in his attempt to convert the Mormons to reveal the reinstitution of plural marriage as part of God's eschatological plan and to invite his new converts to join him in Mexico to initiate the practice, something about which there is some evidence in the speculation of such speculation in the press, in particular an article, Did Dowie Preach Polygamy in Zion in the Salt Lake City Telegram? Now the effect of such a strategy so soon after the church's renunciation of the practice in the manifesto uh, is difficult to calculate, but easy to imagine. Um, this is in that transitional period, uh, one might say, the mopping up period after the manifesto. And um, quite interesting. Dowie died before being able to actualize his plans. But again, you have kind of remarkably interesting convergences. The third uh, example I want to discuss is Charles Fox Parham. Parham's dates are 1873 to 1929. Parham, uh, Parham is widely considered to be one of the fathers of the modern Pentecostal movement. He was a former Methodist minister who, with his wife Sarah, opened a healing home in Topeka, Kansas in 1898. He had visited a number of the early holiness sites, including Frank Sanford's school in Shiloh, Maine, and Dowie's Zion City, Illinois. Convinced that tongues was the Bible evidence of spirit baptism in the book of Acts, at a watch night service on December 31, 1900, one of Parham's students, Agnes Osmond, was baptized in the spirit and spoke in tongues. In the next few days, over half the student body of 34 would also experience spirit baptism. Parham's best-known student would turn out to be an African-American minister named William Seymour, who, owing to the segregation laws in force in much of the South, had to sit outside of a school Parham had attend, uh, established in Houston, Texas, with the door open so that he could hear the lectures. Seymour eventually moved to Los Angeles, California, where he would lead the great Azusa Street Revival from 1906 through 1908, a revival movement that helped transform the religious landscape of the 20th century and beyond. What is not as well known is the fact that Parham held rather tenaciously throughout his life to a form of British Israel, uh, Israelism, Emerging in the 19th century as a rough contemporary to the Book of Mormon, British Israelism taught that Anglo-Saxons as a race were the descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes. This view became tied to racist thinking of the time, with the result that Anglo-Saxon came to mean the white people of North America, in contrast to any persons of color, whether African Americans, Native Americans, or those of Mexican, Spanish, or Asian origins. In contrast to Book of Mormon teaching, Native Americans were not seen to be descendants of the tribes of Israel, but in keeping with the Book of Mormon, British Israelism gave a theological definition to race and color, indicating one's propensity to being able to receive theological and spiritual truths, thus indicating something of one's spiritual destiny. Though there are major differences between the Book of Mormon understanding the origins of the inhabitants of North America and Parham's understanding, it may not be insignificant that both views espouse non-traditional explanations for the inhabitants of the continent, and it's even more possible that the influence of British Israelitism had an impact on the theolog theological self-identity of some of the LDS family of churches. There's been some work done by uh, Grant Underwood and, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, 
Is it Van Norden who wrote the piece on George Reynolds? Um, apparently Reynolds held quite tenaciously to this. Uh, at the same time, I mean, he was he was a chronological contemporary with Parham, uh, and so um, all of that's just kind of interesting to me that you've got in the background these sorts of convergences that uh, the different parts of the traditions don't tend to want to talk a whole lot about. Okay, so that's that's part one. Um, this is supposed to have three parts, but likely we'll have two. Uh, let me focus our attention on early Pentecostal responses to and critiques of the Book of Mormon and the, relig the religions it spawned. Um, and let me say, as far as I know, none of this work has been done before. What I've done is to look at the earliest Pentecostal periodical literature to see if Book of Mormon, in which I'm particularly interested in, uh, Mormonism shows up in the landscape. Now the very first reference we get is from um, a founder of uh, my particular tribe, Richard Sperling. He wrote a little book called The Lost Link that got published about 1920 but was written in the, in the 1890s which kind of predates a lot of this periodical literature. And that's where we'll begin. Sperling says, But some will say, You said that everyone should be led by the Spirit. Now suppose someone would claim that the Spirit led them to steal, or curse, or fight, or have more wives than one, as do the Mormons. We answer the questions first by saying, all these things are violations of the New Testament. It cannot be upheld by the church. Mormons will say, Paul said bishops and deacons should be the husband of one wife. That implies that others might have more. But stop. You can't make that hold good. A widow cannot become a church charge unless she has been the wife of one husband. Having washed the disciple or the saint's feet, Uh, also brought up children and followed every good work. Paul said, the wife of one husband. You have the same right to say that women had more husbands than one, and of course women did not practice polygamy. Well, I suppose you could say they did practice polygamy, not in the way it's Sperling is saying. And while on this subject, I want to say some adulterous-hearted men who would walk after the flesh in its ungodly lust, will say, look at Abraham and Jacob and David, who had more than one wife. Why did God suffer it? He suffered it because he had made such an extravagant promises to Abraham to greatly multiply his seed as the sand of the sea without number. This helped them to multiply, but Paul says the law has changed since then. And then cites Hebrews 7.12. Now it's not surprising that in this first reference to Mormonism, spirit activity and polygamy would be referenced owing to the prophetic nature of the movement and the recently announced manifesto rejecting the practice of, of uh, polygamy. I want to go to the next piece, which is in a, a, a document called The Bridegroom's Messenger. I found this to be quite interesting. 1908. Bridegroom's Messenger sometimes thought of as uh, the, the Apostolic Faith, which was the Azusa Street newsletter, as, as Apostolic Faith East, um, and, and became kind of a magnet for writers from all kinds of Pentecostal groups in the Southeast. Why don't you write about the Mormons talking in tongues? Is the question somebody sends in. And the answer is given as follows. First, I know of no well-authenticating facts concerning the tongues movement among that people. I'm not willing to receive the statements of their leaders upon that or any other subject. My acquaintance with them in the Rocky Mountain states and territories back in the early 70s are not approving. So far as their conduct or their word was concerned, they also claim many faith cures, prophesying, etc., no one rejects faith healing or spiritual discernment because Mormons claim the gifts. Why use their claims of tongues against true believers talking in tongues? However, 
faults Mormon leadership may be, doubtless God may have a people even among them. The writer met with such a one in Utah in 1872, an elderly woman. She was once a zealous Methodist, and in her blind sincerity told me that to her the Mormons seemed like the old-fashioned Methodists. She still seemed to be saintly, serious, a real child of God. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And the Holy Spirit will take up his abode in such a heart, whatever be his or her religious association. Now this short note is clear that Mormon leadership is not to be trusted, that healing and prophecy are found amongst the Mormons, and that the comparison of Pentecostal glossolalia to that of Mormonism is not appreciated, to say the least. Yet amazingly, the response takes an unexpectedly generous turn when addressing the possibility of true believers being found amongst the Mormons. It appears that the case of the elderly woman mentioned in the quote is taken as an indication that God may have a people even among them. I know you're all relieved to hear that. Uh, I was quite surprised by that. What I expected was rejection, right? Condemnation, just across the board. But in this, this earliest, aside from Sperling's thing, in this earliest one, there is this kind of... Um, well, response that has a little bit of place for um, inclusion. Another reference to Mormonism appears in 1911, the Bridegroom's Messenger, where it is noted, let me see, that's not it, is it? Um, well, I'll skip over that one. I want to go to the to, to this one which is, again, Bridegroom's Messenger. Some of God's dear children, some who have received the Pentecostal experience, have become interested in Mormonism by listening to Mormon elders who come to their door, give out the literature, tell of wonderful things having been revealed to their leaders, talk knowingly of deeply spiritual truths, such as divine healing, baptism, the Spirit with speaking in tongues, etc. Like all other false teachers, they will keep the errors covered, until the victim is sufficiently fascinated with their false system of religions. Now, <laughs> owing to a number of similarity between the movements, Mormonism, it appears to me, was perceived as a threat by these early Pentecostals. Right? But notice that it's the similarities that again kind of crop up. Um, let me see which one I've included next. A. A. Body. Uh, British Pentecostal wrote, a, wrote and edited a magazine called Confidence. Uh, Anglican uh, cleric baptized in the Spirit. This is what he says. Uh, we take the scripture literally, continued Mr. Body. We believe they are inspired of the Holy Ghost and written by those whom God chose as his channels. And we believe that the Christian scriptures are the final revelation of God and need not be expanded either by a Book of Mormon or by Mrs. Eddy's Science and Health. In these words, the rejection of the Book of Mormon is based in part on the fact that the Bible is final and complete in scripturated revelation of God. Not only do they reveal early Pentecostalism's commitment to scripture, but also this, this, the fact that despite a belief in continu continuing revelation, which Pentecostals certainly have, Additional inscripturated revelation was not an expectation of the movement. Let me see if I've included the next one. Yes. Uh, this occurs in the Latter Rain Evangel, 1912. Those who have been less spiritual have been led into grievous error as the Roman Catholic Church in accepting the Apocrypha the Mohammedans in accepting the Quran and the Mormons in accepting the Book of Mormon is inspired of God. 
Also, the Mormon religion, which is a blot upon 20th century civilization and is a menace to the government of the United States today, need never have had the follower, need never have been had the followers of Joseph Smith stood firm against the false claims of the Book of Mormon as being inspired of God. It's very interesting what, what follows. The friends of Joseph Smith, sorry about that, I am not a professional entertainer. Uh, the friends of Joseph Smith must have thought that the Book of Mormon did their hearts good. Else why should a poor, ignorant, uncultured man of loose morals have had such a following? The series of books we are now discussing may well seem to do our hearts good, for they hold out to us the promise of that deliverance and power so many are feeling the need of today. The question is not, do these books seem to do our hearts good, but are they truth? Can anyone be really God's truth for us, that, that anything be, really be God's truth for us that is, not ba that is based on the false foundation of coming to us with the weight and authority of the word, if that word shows such claims to be untrue. He goes on to quote. Now, it would appear likely that the writer here makes reference to Moroni's invitation to the reader to ask God with a sincere heart whether the Book of Mormon is true or not that doing one's heart good seems to reflect knowledge of that. Significantly, the writer does not question whether any of the books under discussion are capable of doing one's heart good, but rather refocuses the discussion on whether the books are to be equated with truth. It is clear that the writer does not share the view that doing good to one's heart is sufficient to determine if a book is indeed a word from God. G.F. Taylor, early Pentecostal holiness writer, I think he writes this quote in 1918, describes um, the Book of Mormon in a statement of faith in which uh, the article is entitled, The Pentecostal Church is Utterly Opposed to Mormonism. I okay. wonder where he's going with this one. He, Smith claims, Sometimes you don't have to read the article to you. you. You already know. He claims that the volume was composed of gold plates, eight inches by seven inches, fastened by three golden rings, written in reformed Egyptian, interpreted by the aid of two crystals, set like spectacles in a silver bow. He gave a summary of American history from Babel to 420 A.D. Its authors were the prophet Mormon and his son Moroni. Uh, he goes on to say, let me just kind of quickly go through here. We oppose them because of the claims of their founder. We oppose them because they discredit parts of the Bible, hold other books to be as much, as much or more inspired than the Bible. He goes right on down the list. Um, another another uh, exposition, Ian Bell says some similar sorts of things. Uh, Ian Bell's piece appears in 1920. Um, and then in a final one, there are, um, there's an article that basically says, you know, they say a lot of the same things we say. Keep your people away from them. They'll get confused, et cetera, et cetera. There's some others that I've not included, but in the interest of time, let me just... Let me just kind of summarize some stuff that I found here, some of which you will see. First, it's clear to me that early Pentecostalism had some familiarity with the Book of Mormon and the religions it spawned. Specifically, these early journals show knowledge of Mormon claims as to the book's origins, its theological contents, its extra-canonical status, and its claims over against the Bible or claims made for the Book of Mormon over against the Bible, we could say. Second, more than one of the quotes reveals a concern about the potential danger Mormonism posed for individual Pentecostals. For the most part, it appears that the similarities between the two movements' teachings were thought to have the potential to lead away 
some faithful and sincere Pentecostals into theological error. Third, at least one inquiry was made about the distinctive Pentecostal practice of speaking in tongues and the fact that such, a, uh, that such had found a place at least for a while amongst Mormons. While this inquiry was treated with a certain degree of derision, note my stronger word there, Charlie, uh, at your suggestion, uh, by the editor, its inclusion does suggest that such a practice was known about the Mormons amongst the Mormons. Fourth, often Mormonism was condemned in part owing to its former practice of polygamy, a practice that was no longer sanctioned after 1890, but was still in recent history, if not in some practice. Uh, so there, those statements don't seem to me to just be pot shot statements. Uh, they seem to be recent history at, at the least. Uh, and if uh, Dowie is ready to come and try to convert all the Mormons and reintroduce plural marriage, uh, that may have some kind of uh, significance in terms of how we read these. Uh, several references in the early Pentecostal literature suggest that the practice continued unofficially at the time of the writings, that is from 1908 through 1920. Fifth, at least on one occasion, a distinction, I didn't read this one, was made between the LDS and RLDS churches, though there appears to be some confusion as to which of the groups Joseph Smith III assumed leadership and the timing of his taking it up. Somebody says something about um, Tripp, as I sometimes call him, uh, taking over the leadership of the church at the time of his father's death. And uh, so obviously they didn't get those details right. Six, there is a clear and consistent rejection of Mormonism as leadership across early Pentecostalism. The rationale for much of this rejection centered on the distinctive claims made by and about Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. Specifically, there was a rejection of the need for additional inscripturated revelation beyond the Bible and Mormon claims that appeared to exalt the Book of Mormon whilst de deprecating the role and function of the Bible. Seventh, despite such clear and consistent rejection, at least on one occasion, in fact, in the earliest reference, an attitude of generosity about salvation for individual Mormons and even for the possibility that the people of God could be raised up by God amongst them was seen as a distinct possibility. Eighth, on at least one occasion, it appears that an early Pentecostal critique took the shape of a response to the invitation of Moroni 10, 4, and 5, making a distinction between feeling and truth as sufficient means of verification for the Book of Mormon and its claims. Such a distinction reveals something about the acquaintance by the writer with the invitation of Moroni and how seriously that invitation was taken. Now, if I had unlimited time and I was told that I could take all the time I wanted, but I, we had to be out of here by one. <laughs> um, I said, well, you know, Pentecostals, we don't really work on the same kind of time frame as other people. So in Pentecost, if you got the microphone, you got the service. And so close those doors. I got some stuff I want to do here. Uh, no, what, if I had the time, what I would, somebody just left. If I had the time, uh, if I had the time, what I wanted to do was look at what, what Pentecostalism, uh, the heart of Pentecostalism. Fivefold gospel. Jesus is Savior, Sanctifier, Spirit Baptizer, Healer, and Soon Coming King. And compare that with those themes in the Book of Mormon. Okay, one of my one of my chapters, I've got about an 80-page chapter on uh, or chapters on the theology of the Book of Mormon. What I've tried to do here was to reflect what the similarities and differences were or are between Pentecostalism and the Book of Mormon. Not Mormonism. You know, I was trying to like, kind of like trying to hit a moving train, right? Not Community of Christ. You know, the, the one that seems to be closer, closest to Pentecostalism is the Church of Jesus Christ up in Monongahela, uh, Pennsylvania, which, which practices glossolalia. Women have a, a bit more prominent role. They practice foot washing. Uh, there are a number of similarities there. But it's not to that, it's, it's to this one book. I'm trying to hit a particular object, right, in the Book of Mormon. And uh, 
I, let me just say publicly that I, I owe a, a great deal of uh, debt to Charlie Harrell, uh, who uh, read through those chapters or that section and spared me from many errors uh, and helped me understand the way more perfectly, uh, to use a good biblical turn of phrase. Uh, but, but just to say, there, there, if you lay these two over across the top of one another, it's amazing the places where the similarities occur and the differences occur. What is and is not in the text. So one quick example. Jesus as coming king is everywhere in Pentecostalism. It's the engine that drives the train. It empowers everything else. No need to get people saved if Jesus isn't coming back. To live holy lives if he's not coming back. To be empowered by the spirit to witness. To, to be praying for people to get healed. If Jesus isn't coming back soon, none of those things matter much. Now, Grant Underwood has shown that there is this kind of millennial drive in early Mormonism. But there's only two texts in the Book of Mormon, maybe three, yay, even three, that have reference to the return of Jesus. Plenty of texts about his coming, i.e. to North America, right? I was very surprised by that. Uh, surprised by what is and isn't there. It seems to me that those are kind of at least first steps in trying to uh, have conversations uh, about that. Now, I imagine there's not going to be too many people over on this side, and you may be lining up over there. Uh, we only have room to one, so we're all, we're all saved by that point. I think we need to shut down now, Brian. Sorry that uh, I didn't leave any more time. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with you uh, after we dismiss. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you for having me and listening to me. Thank you.